All right. Also, uh, I wasn't able, they didn't allow me to like extend the time. Oh, so we got a boogie? Uh, possibly. It's more of a, maybe we'll maybe we just stay until like, right. someone kicks us out. Right. Yeah. Alright, this should be good. Yeah, dude, I really wanted to like try it out like, oh, we can live stream, we can do this, we can do that. Mm. But, mm -hmm. Next time. Yeah. And yeah. We'll, we'll continue to like experiment and push it and see. Yeah. See what works. Yep. Get people in like on the Discord, so have them like Discord or Zoom lives, yeah, do do all this stuff. All right. Uh, the three three puff pass kind of style. Yeah, Is that what you're thinking like three three paragraphs and then mm -hmm. perfect. Or let me see. I oh, don't know. Some of these some of these sections are longer than others. Yeah. Okay. All right, what's up, uh, video? I'm Nance. I'm Cesar. We are reading Totality and Infinity um, by Emmanuel Levinas. So if you're in the Discord, if, if you're in the course, this video will be posted there. Um, we hope we could do more in-person reading sessions in the future and maybe even loop some other people from the course in on it. But for now, this is take one. Here at the Tempe Public Library. Um, Damn, putting 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 our little uh, marker <laughs> on the map yeah, huh? yeah, <laughs> for all the internet to see. For all the internet to see, um, and we'll get going. I I had some stuff that pushed our time window back, so we'll see what we get done. Um, you want to take it away? Yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, let's see what it's called. Section one, the same and the other. Subsection A, <laughs> metaphysics and transcendence. Subsection one, desire for the invisible. The true life is absent, but we are in the world. Metaphysics arises and is maintained in this alibi. It is turned toward the elsewhere and the otherwise, and the other. For in the most general form, it has assumed in the history of thought, it appears as a movement going forth from a world that is familiar to us, whatever be the yet unknown lands that bound it, or that it hides from view, from an at home, chez soi, which we inhabit toward an alien outside of oneself or is this soi toward a yonder. The term of this movement, the elsewhere or the other, is called other in an eminent sense. No journey, no change of climate or of scenery could satisfy the desire bent toward it. The other metaphysically desired is not other like the bread I eat, the land in which I dwell, the landscape I contemplate, like sometimes myself for myself, this I, that other. I can feed on these realities and to a very great extent satisfy myself as though I had simply been lacking them. Their alterity 
is thereby reabsorbed into my own identity as a thinker or a possessor. The metaphysical desire tends toward something else entirely, toward the absolutely other. The customary analysis of desire cannot explain away its singular pretension. As commonly interpreted, need would be at the basis of desire. Desire would categorize or would char characterize a being indignant and incomplete or fallen from its past grandeur. It would coincide with the consciousness of what has been lost. It would be essentially a nostalgia, a longing for return, but thus it would not even suspect what the very veritably other is. The metaphysical desire does not long to return, for it is desire for a land not of our birth, for a land foreign to every nature, which has not been our fatherland, and to which we shall never betake ourselves. The metaphysical desire does not rest upon any prior kinship, it is a desire that cannot be satisfied. For we speak lightly of desire satisfied, or of sexual needs, or even of moral and religious needs. Love itself is thus taken to be the satisfaction of a sublime hunger. If this language is possible, it is because most of our desires and love, too, are not pure. The desires one can satisfy resemble metaphysical desire only in the deceptions of satisfaction or in the exasperation of non-satisfaction, and desire which constitutes voluptuous, voluptuosity itself. The metaphysical desire has another intention. It desires beyond everything that can simply complete it. It is like goodness. The, the big desired does not fulfill it, but deepens it. Mm. It is a generosity nourished by the big desired, and thus a relationship that is not the disappearance of distance, not a bringing together, or to circumscribe more closely the essence of generosity and of goodness. A relationship whose positivity comes from remoteness, from separation, for it nourishes itself, one might say, with its hunger. This remoteness is radical only if desire is not the possibility of anticipating the desirable, if it does not think it beforehand. If it goes toward it aimlessly, that is, toward an absolute, unanticipatable alterity, as one goes forth unto death. Desire is absolute if the desiring being is mortal and the desired invisible. Invisibility does not denote an absence of relation. It implies relations with what is not given, of which there is no idea. Vision is an adequation of the idea with the thing, a, compre a comprehension that encompasses. Non-adequation does not denote a simple negation or an obscurity of the idea but beyond the light and the night, beyond the knowledge measuring beings, the inordinateness of desire. Desire is desire for the absolutely other. Besides the hunger one satisfies, the thirst one quenches, and the senses one allays, metaphysics desires the other beyond satisfactions, where no gesture by the body to diminish the aspiration is possible, where it is not possible to sketch out any known caress nor invent any new caress, a desire without satisfaction which precisely understands and tends the remoteness, the alterity, and the exteriority of the other. For desire, this alterity, non-adequate to the idea, has a meaning. It is understood as the alterity of the other and of the most high. The very dimension of height is opened up by metaphysical desire. 
that this height is no longer the heavens, but the invisible is the very elevation of height and its nobility. To die for the invisible, this is metaphysics. This does not mean that desire can dispense with acts, but these acts are neither consumption, nor caress, nor liturgy. Demented pretension to the invisible, when the acute experience of the human in the 20th century teaches that the thoughts of men are born by needs which explain society and history, that hunger and fear can prevail over every human resistance and every freedom. There is no question of doubting this human misery, this dominion, the things and wicked exercise over man, this animality. But to be a man is to know that this is so. Freedom consists in knowing that freedom is in peril. But to know or to be conscious is to have time to avoid and forestall the instant of humanity. It is this perpetual postponing of the hour of treason infinitesimal difference between man and non-man that implies the disinterestedness of goodness, the desire of the absolutely other or nobility, the dimension of metaphysics. Section two, or subsection two, the breach of totality. Should we comment on it? Uh, I, or at least maybe like pause and, and just yeah. say like, I think because this is a hard mode text, mm -hmm. uh, it might be useful maybe uh, just to even say, what do we even think these two pages are talking about? Yeah. <laughs> just for our own sake. I think for me, I get just that this metaphysical desire for the absolute alterity is different from what gets called desire. Um, you don't, you don't desire a thing that can satisfy you. Like you, you desire something truly other than you. Mm. Okay. Let's see. The, the few notes I wrote it are. Oh, um. Yeah, something I was kind of focusing on is he. Uh, he says. We do have this this want to relate to something that is not part of our homeland, mm. uh, and so I don't know that that seems kind of interesting. Of like something to pause on to say, it is that true? It, it probably is, but um. Uh, it's kind of tricky to know why what we're even interested in in yeah. something that's not from our homeland. And he uses, I guess, the word that gets translated. I don't know if it's the word he actually used, but he it says fatherland. Uh, that's a good question. Yeah. So it almost kind of has that. Uh, it means something <laughs> during during a twentieth century. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Post World War Two, you know. To, to want something beyond your fatherland. To, to, to be curious, maybe, about the other. Right. Yeah. Genuinely curious about the concrete other as opposed to... I don't know. Yeah, just the other that exists in your, your own right. place. Yeah. Yeah, I think... Um, there's going to be a lot said about ideology in the sense like ideology is this thing that kind of covers up what's actually going on like ideology is a lie and i think he's writing in response to world war ii and the horrible shit that that happened that was ideology that was all just kind of a big lie and he's trying to see beyond it like it, like he really is trying to think about I guess what he calls the infinite or, or infinity or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of constituted by this absolute other. But yeah, dude, the fatherland. That's a good question. I have the French book at home. Oh, okay. So I, and, well, and we have Terrence who will be in the course on Fridays, I think. Yeah. So Terrence, you have to give us some comments. Yeah. What word is he using? 
is there any, I don't know, how is that, how is that word used in French and other places? Okay, I'm, I'm ready to keep telling. Cool. Um, subsection two, the breach of totality. This absolute exteriority of the metaphysical term, the irreducibility of movement to an inward play, to a simple presence of self to self is, if not demonstrated, claimed by the word transcendent. The metaphysical movement is transcendent and transcendence, like desire and inadequation, is necessarily a trans-ascendence. Footnote. We borrow this term from Jean Wall, sur l'idée de la transcendance, transcendance. In existence humaine et transcendance, we have drawn much inspiration from the things evoked in that study. So that trans-ascendance comes from John Wall. It's a good thing you read it out loud because I I didn't pick up that he was like doing oh, like a transcendence word. and transcendence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I miss that. Like, that tripped me up. That tripped me up the first <laughs> the first time I saw it. I was uh, okay. Like, Wait, every transcendence is necessarily transcendence. Yeah, what are you doing? That that sounds like Heidegger. <laughs> but he's doing like he's like, no, I'm actually doing something here. Okay. The transcendence with which the metaphysician designates it is a distinctive, is distinctive in that the distance it expresses, unlike all distances, enters into the way of existing of the exterior being. Its formal characteristic, to be other, makes up its content. Thus, the metaphysician and the other cannot be totalized. The metaphysician is absolutely separated. I, I'm, that's lost on me. So I'm going to be coming back to that. Mm -hmm. The metaphysician and the other do not constitute a simple correlation, which would be reversible. The reversibility of a relation where the terms are indifferent, indifferently read from left to right and from right to left would couple them the one to the other. They would complete one another in a system visible from the outside. The intended transcendence would be thus reabsorbed into the unity of the system, destroying the radical alterity of the other. Irreversibility does not only mean that the same goes unto the other differently than the other unto the same. That eventuality does not enter into account. The radical separation between the same and the other means precisely that it is impossible to place oneself outside of the correlation between the same and the other, so as to record the correspondence, or the non-correspondence, of this going with this return. Otherwise, the same and the other would be reunited under one gaze, and the absolute distance that separates them filled in. The alterity, the radical heterogeneity of the other, is possible only if the other is other with respect to a term whose essence is to remain at the point of departure, to serve as entry into the relation, to be the same not relatively but absolutely, a term can remain absolutely at the point of departure of relationship only as I. To be I is over and beyond any individuation that can be derived from a system of references to have identity as one's content. The I is not a being that always remains the same, but is the being whose existing consists in identifying itself, in recovering its identity throughout all that happens to it. It is the primal identity, the primordial work of identification. The eye is identical in its very alterations. It represents them to itself and thinks them. The universal identity in which the heterogeneous can be embraced 
has the ossature of a subject of the first person. Universal thought is an I think. The I is identical in its very alterations in yet another sense. The I that thinks hearkens to itself thinking or takes fright before its depths and is to itself an other. It thus discovers the famous naivety of its thought, which thinks straight on as one follows one's nose. It hearkens to itself thinking and surprises itself being dogmatic, foreign to itself. But faced with this alterity, the I is the same, merges with itself, is incapable of apostasy with regard to this surprising self. Hegelian phenomenology, where self-consciousness is the distinguishing of what is not distinct, expresses the universality of the same, identifying itself in the alterity of objects thought, and despite the opposition of self to self. I distinguish myself from myself, and therein I am immediately aware that this factor distinguished from me is not distinguished. I, the self-same being, thrust myself away from myself, but this which is distinguished, which is set up as unlike me, is immediately on its being distinguished no what the fuck is immediately on its being distinguished no alterity of the other. Oh wait, no what? no distinction for me. Oh that's why it was in here. Okay. No Distinction from, okay, hold on. Are you got I, the self same being, thrust myself away from myself with this, which is distinguished, which is set up as unlike me, is immediately on its being distinguished. No distinction for me. Okay. The difference is not a difference. The uh -huh. I, as other, is not an other. We will not retain from this citation Hegel's affirmation of the provisional character of immediate evidence. The I that repels the self lived as repugnance. The I riveted to itself lived as ennui. Our modes of self-consciousness and rest on the unrendable identity of the I and the self. The alterity of the I that takes itself for another may strike the imagination of the poet precisely because it is but the play of the same. The negation of the I by the self is precisely one of the modes of identification of the I. So I, I just realized uh, that like little complicated part was yeah. a Hegel quote. Oh! From the phenomenology of mind. You're right. And then, so I guess he's then commenting, I mean, this, I guess this must be something like dialectics. That he's basically trying to point out. So yeah, Hegel's Hegel's dialectics is lack in that, like this process is one predicated on the lack. Like this, I become me through this dialectical process because there's a hole in me that's then filled in by this process. Whereas Levinas is like, there is no lack. Like you can still do this dialectical movement, but it's not. A filling in of your identity, it's actually a distancing from the I. Mm. Which is interesting. Um, yeah, I guess maybe another note I had from all this stuff we've read so far is. Is what? <laughs> That's my note. What? <laughs> is, what? is, uh, he he's basically saying you can't make the same and the other. Mm. Uh, I I the way I put it in my notes is you can't put them in the same equation. They, so the self same and the other are incompatible or yeah. unintelligible. Yeah, it's like um, it wouldn't make sense to put them in an equation because in an equal sign equation because there wouldn't be anything you could do to make them equal yeah. uh, because, well, Levinas is saying there's a radical separation between the same and the other, mm -hmm. um, which is why you can't collapse them into the same system mm -hmm. necessarily. 
So, so it's sounding like Levinas is saying, uh, you're, you're just going to have to think of them as two different things. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It, yeah. You can never, but you can never totalize. I don't know wherever he said that, but he said like, it can't be totalized. You can't, you can't put a label on that and say, you are what I say you are. It's just, it's not possible. And I can't, I can't use myself to do that with that equation. Mm. You can't, I can't make you equal me. Like there is something about you that is unintelligible to me and I have to accept it. Yeah. Yeah. So then, uh, oh, it's my turn. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> I'm already, like that last paragraph, Good. Tripped you? Yeah, like I'm gonna have to <laughs> think about it. I'm gonna have to like I, I don't get it. Like I'm I am already lost in the woods. Yeah. And we're on the third page of the text. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. Okay. We're we're continuing this Hegel I. <laughs> um the identification of the same in the I is not produced as a monotonous tautology. I am I. The, origin, the originality of identification, irreducible to the A is A formally, formalism, would thus escape attention. It is not to be fixed by reflecting on the abstract representation of self by self. It is necessary to begin with the concrete relationship between an I and a world. The world, foreign and hostile, should, in good logic, alter the I. But the true and primordial relation between them and that in which the I is revealed precisely as preeminently the same is produced as a sojourn, sejour, in the world. The way of the I against the other of the world consists in sojourning, in identifying oneself by existing here at home with oneself. Chez soi. In a world which is from the first other than other the in a world which is from the first other the I is nonetheless uh how would you say that word? Uh, uh talk Oh that's that word Yeah uh, auto Autochtonous. Autochtonous. Okay. Is nonetheless autochtonous. It is the very reversion of this alteration. It finds in the world a site, lu, and a home, maison. Dwelling is the very mode of maintaining oneself, said to Nair. Uh, note, Setenaire involves the notion of containing oneself. It is the idea of an active identity with oneself. It also involves the notion of holding oneself up, of standing, of having a stance, which is at the same time a position and an attitude, a posture and an intention. Hence, Levinas immediately passes to the idea of the I can it implicates. Hmm. So I'll, I'll just read that sentence again. Dwelling is the very mode of maintaining oneself, said to Nair, not as the famous serpent grasping itself by binding onto its tail, but as the body that, on the earth exterior to it, holds itself up, said and can. The at home, the chez is not a container, but a site where I can, where, depending on a reality that is other, I am, despite this dependence or thanks to it, free. It is enough to walk, to do, fair, in order to grasp anything, to take. In a sense, everything is in the site. In the last analysis, everything is at my disposal. Even the stars, if I but reckon them, calculate the intermediaries or the means. The sight, 
a medium, le lieu, milieu, affords means. Everything is here. Everything belongs to me. Everything is caught up in advance with the primordial occupying of a site. Everything is comprehended. And then there's like a French version of what, what was just said in the notes. Uh, the possibility of possessing, that is, of suspending the very alterity of what is only at first other, and other relative to me, is the way of the same. I am at home with myself in the world because it offers itself to or resists possession. What is absolutely other does, does not only resist possession, but contests it and accordingly can consecrate it. This reversion of the alterity of the world to self-identification must be taken seriously. The moments of this identification, the body, the home, labor, possession, economy, are not to figure as empirical and contingent data laid over the formal skeleton of the same. They are the articulations of this structure. The identification of the same is not the void of a tautology nor a dialectical opposition to the other, but the concreteness of egoism. This is important for the possibility of metaphysics. If the same would establish its identity by simple opposition to the other, it would already be a part of a totality encompassing the same and the other. The pretension of metaphysical desire with which we began, the relationship with the absolutely other would be belied. But the metaphysician's separation from the metaphysical, which is maintained within the relationship by being produced as an egoism, is not the simple obverse of that relationship. But how can the same, produced as egoism, enter into relationship with an other without immediately divesting it of its alterity? What is the nature of this relationship? The metaphysical relation cannot be properly, cannot be properly speaking a representation, for the other would therein dissolve into the same. Every representation is essentially interpretable as a transcendental constitution. The other with which the metaphysician is in relationship and which he recognizes as other is not simply in another locality. This other recalls Plato's ideas, which according to Aristotle's formula, are not in a sight. The sway, pouvoir, of the eye will not cross the distance marked by the alterity of the other. To be sure, my own most inward sphere of intimacy appears to me as foreign or hostile. Usage objects, foods, the very world we inhabit are other in relation to us. But the alterity of the eye and the world inhabited is only formal, as we have indicated in a world in which I sojourn, this alterity falls under my powers. The metaphysical other is other with an alterity that is not formal, is not the simple reverse of identity, and is not formed out of resistance to the same, but is prior to every initiative, to all imperialism of the same. It is other with an alterity constitutive of the very content of the other. other with an alterity that does not limit the same, for in limiting the same, that other would not be rigorously other. By virtue of the common frontiers, the other within the system would yet be the same. The absolutely other is the other, big other. He and I do not form a number. The collectivity in which I say you or we is not a plural of the I. I you, these are not individuals of a common concept. Neither possession, nor the unity of number, nor the unity of concepts link me to the stranger. 
the stranger who disturbs the being at home with oneself, le chez soi, but stranger also means the free one. Over him I have no power. He escapes my grasp by an essential dimension, even if I have him at my disposal. He is not wholly in my sight, but I, who have no concept in common with the stranger, am, like him, without genus. We are the same and the other. The conjunction and here designates neither addition nor power of one term over the other. We shall try to show that the relation between the same and the other, upon which we seem to impose such extraordinary conditions, is language. For language accomplishes a relation such that the terms are not limitroph. What? Limitroph? Limitroph. Okay. That the terms are not limitroph or limitrophy within this relation such that the other, despite the relationship with the same, remains transcendent to the same. The relation between the same and the other, metaphysics, is primordi primordially enacted as conversation, where the same, gathered up in its, its seity as an I, as a particular existent, unique, and autochthonous, leaves itself. A relation whose terms do not form a totality can hence be produced within the general economy of being only as proceeding, proceeding from the I to the other as a face-to-face, -face, as delineating a distance in depth, that of conversation, of goodness, of big desire, irreducible to the distance that synthetic activity of the understanding establishes between the diverse terms, other with respect to one another, that lend themselves to this to its synoptic operation. The I is not a contingent formation by which the same and the other, as logical determinations of being, can in addition be reflected within a thought. It is in order that alterity be produced in being that a thought is needed and that an I is needed. The irreversibility of the relation can be produced only if the relation is affected by one of the terms as the very movement of transcendence, as the traversing of this distance, and not as a recording of or the psychological invention of this movement. Thought and interiority are the very breakup of being and the production, not the reflection, of transcendence. We know this relation only in the measure that we effect it. This is what is distinctive about it. Alterity is possible only starting from me. Conversation from the very fact that it maintains the distance between me and the other, the radical separation asserted in transcendence, which prevents the reconstitution of totality, cannot renounce the egoism of its, of its existence. But the very fact of being in a conversation consists in recognizing in the other, big other, a right over this egoism, and hence in justifying oneself. Apology, in which the I at the same time asserts itself and inclines before the transcendent, belongs to the essence of conversation. The goodness in which, as we will see further, conversation issues and from which it draws signification will not undo this apologetic moment. The breach of totality is not an operation of thought, obtained by a simple distinguishing of terms that evoke one another or at least line up opposite one another. The void that breaks the totality can be maintained against an inevitability totalizing and synoptic thought only if thought finds itself faced with an other refractory to categories. Rather than constituting a total with this other as with an object, thought consists in speaking. We propose to call religion 
the bond, the bond that is established between the same and the other without constituting a totality. But to say that the other can remain absolutely other, that he enters only into the relationship of conversation, is to say that history itself, an identification of the same, cannot claim to totalize the same and the other. The absolutely other, whose alterity is overcome in the philosophy of eminence, of imminence on the allegedly common plane of history, maintains his transcendence in the mists of history. The same is essentially identification within the diverse, or history, or system. It is not I who resists the system, as Kierkegaard's thought, it is the other. That's the end of that section. Subsection two. I think that a lot of that is kind of lost on me, but at least right now. But here at the end, it is not I who resists the system, as Kierkegaard thought, it is the other. Um, I think that's where, or he's saying, like, even when you identify like in relation to, like we were talking about the other day, like, oh, I'm not Jojo Siwa. Like you're still identifying with Jojo Siwa only to say, I'm not her. Um, and using other people or other eyes as kind of tools or props to prop up your own identity um, is always, it's always going to fail to capture them or even talk about them. You're still only talking about yourself. So like the, all the people who were like, oh, it's a basket of deplorables. Like they were really talking about themselves. They weren't being all, oh, look how good we are. They were totalizing everyone else and using them as props to kind of play their, play their game where they're just trying to assert their identity. And when you do that, that's ideology. You're covering up like the possibility of even taking them as others, and you're just no, you're just a tool for me. Like you, you serve my identity only. Mm. Yeah, I, I'm also like now starting to drown. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there, I, I, I can get little um, moments of of air. Mm-hmm. <laughs> as I as I go down to drowning again, mm -hmm. and um, let's see, I something I guess that I I noticed was, I mean this is just like this might be the smallest paragraph <laughs> this whole section, but it says, but how can the same produced as egoism enter into relationship with an other? without immediately divesting it of its alterity. Mm -hmm. So, I guess he's basically starting to uh, gearing up us towards that question of, okay, if you can, if the I can relate to an other, um, how do you do that without uh, stripping it of its otherness yeah and so i think he's he's leading us into what he'll eventually yeah. talk about with uh infinity but that's just kind of like the little glimmer that i saw. yeah he's like he's easing us into or he's like presenting the problem that if infinity doesn't solve any any problem but maybe it maybe it properly labels the problem mm. Like it, it, to call it a problem, I think is wrong. But the the question or the facticity, mm -hmm. like you are an infinity, I'm an infinity, they're infinity. It's like that is that's a fact. And so he's introducing us slowly to that. And yeah, I think right here, enter into relationship with another without complete or without immediately divesting that of its alterity. That's that's what you're doing when you use others as props for your identity, you're covering them over. And so identity itself is becoming ideology. Mm. I like it a lot, man. And yeah, I think 
I think stopping when you start to feel lost is is a good way to read. <laughs> Especially like with this, like I'm, I'm listening to it in my downtime. I'm reading and rereading and kind of going over it. You're gonna crack it. <laughs> I'm not gonna crack it, but yeah. like that's that's how with most books. I don't do that. Yeah, yeah. But like when we're in these courses, it's like this is the opportunity to do that. Mm -hmm. So I can read for five pages and I'm still going to listen to it. I'm still going to read and, and reread it and go back over it. But when I'm like when we're here trying to actually get down to business, like when I, I'm lost, it's like, yeah, I'm, I, I can't continue to try to get to business. Um, yeah. We could feel our brains growing. Yes. Slowly. Yeah. Yeah. Or, um, or as I like to, as I told someone, um, I think this text is gonna not make me smarter, but I hope it's gonna make my heart bigger. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which is maybe the more more worrisome, dude. It's <laughs> like the question, the question of ethics or or morality. Um, I was talking to Dave and Mikey. Like I, I can't, I can't think about it. like mm -hmm. when it comes to global politics. It comes to yeah, yeah. like I can think about morality, like person to person interactions, and maybe even at the community level of like, oh, I shouldn't be, I shouldn't turn my music up loud in the neighborhood because I'll disturb my neighbors. So I like that's an ethical act. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to global scale, mm -hmm. I can't think about it. I'm like I don't no, I, I'm I don't think about that. Yeah, I I want to think about capital. Mm -hmm. I want to think about critical media. Like I, I want to do all these kind of nuts and bolts, um, less human types of theory or whatever, because mm -hmm. this shit's hard. Ethics is fucking hard. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, hopefully it does make our heart <laughs> bigger and and give us the courage to think about it, because it's yeah. it's difficult to really take these questions seriously. Mm -hmm. I, like I legitimately would go, would rather just read Marx and <laughs> like try to understand and, and like do this very mathematical, machinic type of thought. Which Levinas is, and same thing with Illich from from last month. Like this is the type of thought we need to be doing. Like the, the human thought where we're talking about like, well, there are these big questions that we can't answer, but you, that doesn't mean you should run away from them. Like you should still address them. Or at least like face them. Yeah. And I mean, maybe this is. I mean, it's it's kind of hard to think. Is this necessarily a ethic ethics text, mm -hmm. or is it almost more of a phenomenology text? And it's weird because it's kind of uh, that weird mixture of both, oh. which. Um, Maybe that's what feels maddening mm -hmm. about it's like I'm 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 gonna have to get lost. Yep. And get lost again and get lost again. And uh and then maybe I'll start to just like know the forest mm -hmm. because I was just lost in it for so long. Yeah. And it, yeah, it's not like you're mapping the forest, but you're getting habituated to it. Like you're yeah. getting, you're getting comfortable in that forest, but it's still a fucking forest. Mm -hmm. I think Hannah Arendt is also similarly like kind of phenomenological and and ethics kind of blended. Um, but yeah, this is a hard fucking book, mm -hmm. and it's it's it looks short. <laughs> like that to yeah. see that if I didn't know what book that was, if I just mm -hmm. saw that size, yeah, I, I could read that and. I can read that in a couple days. I can yeah. read that in a week. Um, it's like 300 pages. Yeah. <laughs> but 300 pages of, of like, yeah. very, uh, very dense paragraphs. And, yeah, it's compressed. There's a lot. There's a high bit rate. Um, but I think it's, becoming more and more relevant or or maybe not becoming more and more relevant but I'm I am more and more coming to see like I need to fucking get lost in the Levinas forest mm. um 
because I think it does play so well into critical media theory and fucking capital um, and like futurism and tech all the shit that's going on we were talking about collapse mm. like collapse is a subject you think about I think about we live in Phoenix, Arizona where it's it's approaching rapidly it's um, already collapsing it's already <laughs> collapsing but like I, growing. I think this is essential to that because this kind of helps us have the courage to think about those big questions that normally I would just turn away from. Like, no, fuck it. I'm black pill. Like, normally I would just say, oh, we're doomed, fuck it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be the transcendental miserableist. Um, and I still feel like we're doomed, but this is like a, a, a book against pessimism. Mm. Or, or a, like, reading it will be an exercise against the tendency to pessimism. Yeah, you're black peeled. I'm black humor peeled. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm having fun with it. Well, yeah, dude, you have to laugh too. Like, it is funny. Mm -hmm. We're all people take themselves very seriously. It's like, dude, we're gonna die soon. <laughs> <laughs> like that's funny. Yeah, too. or I guess <laughs> as, as Heidegger says, it's like death is like your shadow mm. or something like that. Where mm -hmm. it's like. Uh, you really don't know when your death is gonna be there because it's always it's coming. always there it's always there you carry it around with you exactly yeah you could have died on the way over here and died on the way over here especially yeah. with the way people drive dude that's getting worse too uh, driving habits I, I've tried to write an essay about driving multiple times but like People are horrible drivers. People are <laughs> on their phones. People are in their car and they feel like they're in, like they're separated. Because mm -hmm. they're like, oh, this is me in my car, road rage. I used to get bad road rage, dude. Like, very bad. Mm -hmm. um, but it's like, no, we should all, like, we should all be communists when we're driving. We should all be like, we're sharing the road. We all, like, we have a shared objective here we, yeah. to get somewhere safely. But it's getting worse. Well, uh, Proper communists, not Soviet communists. I, I was gonna say, uh, you might you might have a conversation or like something you would want to work on with uh, um, maybe talking about the the implications of what it means to have these Waymo auto Dude, oh, yeah. automated oh, cars yeah. and how it's automation and it is something like AI related. But at the same time, maybe it is also answering the question of, is it better than humans? I mean, in some, in some cases. <laughs> is it, is like, it a, the communism, communizing factor? <laughs> but but we have to introduce a robot to make the communism work. Because people just can't do it. <laughs> um, but like in, in some ways, it's bad. Like Waymo. And like in some ways, it's horrible. That guy that died in Tempe. There's uh, a bike rider that died from a Waymo car. Uh, um, in Uber and DoorDash. And like the, the gigification slash automation of all industries is bad. Like objectively just bad. Mm. It takes jobs away. It cuts people's safety nets out from under them. It's, it's a bad thing. Like people need to work. Even if we lived in like a utopia, like people would still need to be gainfully involved in some type of activity. Mm hmm um necessary yeah necessary yeah yeah, yeah yeah like there, there are always going to be chores to do and part of being the dishes always have to be the dishes done. always need to be done yeah like and that's good that's actually good to do the dishes mm -hmm. like you it it binds you to your family when you do the dishes <laughs> it really does um but it's also good when when the robot taxis reach a level where they are safer, mm -hmm. that will be good too. Because mm -hmm. people die in traffic all the time. Like, I don't know, you win some, you lose some. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But it is interesting that Phoenix was the pilot city for Waymo. Yeah. And for the robot taxis. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, we're, I'm telling you, dude, we are out ahead of everyone else. We're the future. <laughs> well, it's funny because it's, it's like, 
I mean, I don't know where this technology comes from, but I'm gonna just assume the Bay Area, mm -hmm. Silicon Valley. It's uh, it's funny because it's like maybe we're we're getting San Franciscoized mm -hmm. <laughs> in some ways, where because uh, I'm I'm noticing even these Waymos in um, in the poor neighborhoods, like in, oh, in the neighborhood I live in, and it's yeah, it's funny. Well, it's black humor, funny. Yeah, to see. Uh, robot robot taxi car but there's also just someone pushing their cart in 110 degree weather yeah, the and uh, selling street corn so and it's like oh, and shit. this is a dis <laughs> this is a disparity so there's the there's the businessman in the robot taxi driving down the neighborhood road and then there's the other businessman selling tamales mm -hmm. on this fucking cart in 115 degrees yeah. and they're both they're both businessmen, but things are very different for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, dude, they're the juxtaposition between the future and, I don't know, like the last gasp of the American dream, like the, like the height of the 1990s um, is where I feel like progress kind of stopped, like nothing Nothing real has happened since the 90s. And you see that with the dude pushing his cart, like pushing a street cart. Um, and the kids on the street. Um, and you have to laugh. Yeah. Maybe just to finish on the Levinas point really fast, because I feel like I could just yeah, <laughs> yeah, on other stuff for a long time. Is uh, the, the last thing I took away is uh, I think on this page 38, he says, I think what he's basically saying is that things in the world, usage objects, mm -hmm. can be little other to us. And then on the next page, he says, he starts a paragraph with, the absolutely little other is the big other. Big O other. So that, that idea of when the other is absolute, then it changes to that big O, and uh, we can't, we can't, that's going to look different than usage objects, yeah, yeah. food, the very world we inhabit, our other in relation to us. It, that can't be it for letting us, or at least he's saying, um, Dude. let me tell you why, or I'm, I'm kind of drawing my line in the sand and saying. I like that. Yeah. I think... Like, I think that's Levinas getting, uh, not, not I think, like, that is him getting very Heideggerian where he's making this distinction between, like, objects of care versus objects of concern. Like, the tool can be other, use values can be other to us, but once it becomes, like, absolutely other, it becomes an object of care or even Dasein, like, mm -hmm. so he's, made, he's, he's kind of establishing this stratification with otherness and similarly, I don't know, desire, I think he's doing similar like metaphysical desire as opposed to desire. He definitely has like other and then big other, the absolute other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the last paragraph, I think maybe you read this one, uh, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna chop up this Levinas sentence into what I think are the most important parts. And this relates to the preface, which is, mm. uh, but to say that the other can remain absolutely other is to say that history itself cannot claim to totalize the same in the other. So he uses that, that word history. Mm -hmm. And in the preface, it was that yep. conversation about, or is it in the, Preface? Yeah. About yeah. eschatology yep. um, not being the same as traditional history where we have dates and yeah. things like that, but it's almost like it's this uh, eschatology is almost like this history that can maybe justify happen at any time, mm -hmm. or it's like it's so radical that it can crush <laughs> like uh, traditional like carbon dating history right you know yeah, like, yeah. I, and 
it, the only thing I could think of is when people, when we use the word eschatology, I just think of religious mm -hmm. history. Yeah, the right? book, book of Revelation. Yeah. Like it, it's where there is a very clear kind of teleological justification for why you do what you do. Mm -hmm. um, as opposed to history, which I know it often gets taken very teleologically as well. But no, no, there's something there. Like with eschatology, there's this. Well, that's when history becomes eschatology, right? Like the Soviets took the notion of history, like carbon fossils and industrial progress and all that stuff, and they kind of heightened it to eschatology by talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, historical materialism and like this will necessarily be the outcome and then class war will be over mm -hmm. and so that was their idea of the end of history mm -hmm. so that okay, yeah, yeah. They, they elevated it to this eschatology um, and that's why Trotsky told the, the Mensheviks like go to where you belong to the dust of history with you like he was he was saying you are basically you're on the wrong side of history Mm. And they had elevated history to that eschatology. Mm -hmm. And and yeah, I guess Levinas's point is, or at least maybe what I'm thinking his point is going to be with history is that treating the other as that big O other will, maybe a, a weird way to put it is it'll never go out of style or mm. it will... Um, it'll never get old. It'll never get old. It'll never be uh, subjected to history telling you what the obvious answer should be for the other. Um, I, I, yeah, it's. I, I'm not sure how to say it just yet, but um, no, I I'm think, sure I'll. I'm sure yeah, I'll yeah. pick up on it a little bit more. Like it's. Uh, you could almost take that as like a line of flight from this tele, tele, telos mm -hmm. of like like if you accept the telos and if I just accept that we're doomed and I sit in my black pill mm -hmm. your um, black pill capsule my black pill capsule and, and we're doomed we're doomed we're doomed potentially a line of flight or an escape from that or an ascendance or whatever the word is from that would be to take the other as the big other mm -hmm. because if I stay in the black pill, I can, I can say, yeah, uh, James Lindsay, the guy that I was talking about, James Lindsay is a piece of shit. He's horrible, and he's playing his role in history. Mm -hmm. We're all doomed. And there's, it doesn't matter what you do. There's like nothing can save us now or whatever. But that's totalizing mm -hmm. him and also everyone else by claiming to know. I know what's going to happen. Like, you know I, the telos. I know the telos. Um, forces me to treat everyone as a little other. But if I say, no, I can't do that, I have to treat everyone as a big other, then maybe that could be a way to resist the black pill. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, I almost kind of like to think of it maybe even as like, uh, most of us will not be remembered by mm -hmm. history, mm -hmm. right? But it doesn't change the fact that you can sometimes have experiences with other people in your life or you affected mm -hmm. other people in your life and um, that still had an effect that still played a part in those lives and it whether or not history was uh, I think it makes it more real like like those moments can be more real. Like even, I don't know, the moments that no one could or even should know about. Like mm. um, those moments are more real than like the grand sweeping, I wanna, I wanna be a famous thinker and I wanna contribute. Sure, mm. like that can be a good thing, but that the real contribution is made up of all those moments mm. that are mine. And that are ours and that, that are real and kind of contained the grand moments in history are like fake like it's it's ideological kind of constructs of like and then this happened 
and then this happened, and then this happened. And because history is always written by the winners, of course it's all bullshit. And, and it's, yeah. Yeah, man. I, I think Levinas is, is fucking awesome. And I think... <laughs> Up to which section are we supposed to read? I'm kind of scared. Oh, shit. Uh, was it just to... Was it just to the... Uh... Was it B? I don't, I don't know. even remember how shit's broken up. Yeah. Because, wait, it goes... It goes A, and then A is subdivided. No, it goes one. Mm -hmm. There's four sections. Yeah. And then those are subdivided into letters. So we're doing all of this this month. Is that right? Um, it would seem like it, since there's four sections. No, I don't think we're doing all of No, I think we're going, I think, to here. So one through seven. Mm -hmm. Or one through five and then one through seven, I think. Just for That's, this week though, right? Yeah. Okay. That seems like a lot too, though, now that I think about it. Well, I mean, we got... If we started with the preface, or started at 33, I guess we only went like seven or eight pages. Yeah. Which is <laughs> thick. Yeah. But um, also, we're, we're reading out loud and like mm -hmm. talking about it, so we probably went twice as slow as and I do I like I do recommend if you're if you're not doing it, like listening to it separately and just kind of like like staying in it even when you're not doing like serious reading sessions um it doesn't have to be a lot but maybe 15 15 30 minutes a day like I'm gonna listen to this section and just have it on in the background and let it kind of become like part of your circumspection, let, just let it be there in the background so that it's mm -hmm. working, it's doing its work. And then also coming back and doing deep reading sessions, but like mm -hmm. taking that kind of hybrid approach is, I think, I, I love it. Like that's why I legit, like when we read Being in Time, I think was the first, the first one that I really, it's like I'm gonna do this shit on hard mode. So I was listening to it, reading, rereading. I was writing. I was doing all that shit. And I was like, I've never read a book before. <laughs> like after I read that way, yeah. like I was, I was like, dude, I've been, this is the first book I've ever really read. Well, maybe it was, it was, maybe reading is not even the right verb for it. But dude, it's almost like yeah. you lived, yeah, <laughs> you lived in it yeah. for a. Uh, amount of time yeah yeah and it i lived this book yep <laughs> and I, I don't want to say like oh i understand it but no no yeah i had my kind of fore conception like i had my idea of it before from like whatever cursory half-ass bullshit reading of it i had done in the past mm -hmm. and i just kind of like accepted this is this was hard ever. but then after really reading it like i understand Maybe a little bit, mm. um, but I like I, I have a better overview, and I can kind of see where I am, and, and I can kind of see the ten thousand foot view of the map. Um, whereas before it was yeah, fuck Heidegger, <laughs> and now I like I still don't like Heidegger, mm -hmm. um, but I understand why I will continue to read it. Mm. Which for me, I'm, I'm hoping with Levinas, um, I continue to like him, which I'm sure I will, and I will understand why I will continue to read him more and more and more. Well, I've never read Heidegger's Being in Time, but uh, would you say this is written in a very similar style? Similar enough? Ooh, I would say similar enough. And I would say just in these in the first five pages or seven pages or whatever, I can see a lot of I can see a lot of it in here. Like I can see where Levinas is responding to being in time. 
which I'm sure it'll come up in the in the lectures and the discussions, but I don't know. I think maybe this this is enough to kind of get you in on what's going on. Maybe I don't know about that for sure, but Dave would probably say no, absolutely not. You need to read Heidegger. I mean, it's true. I think you should. Yeah. yeah. Fucking being in time at, at least. And maybe some of the essays, some of the later essays. Yeah, I've only read thinking. the question concerning technology. I think that's an essential one. Yeah. Like that's that's an essential one. But I realize, okay, this is even though I maybe don't understand everything in this mm -hmm. essay, I was like, this is still for the most part like comprehensible. <laughs> Whereas if I were to be like, okay, being in time, here we go. Uh, it's like, I'm going to have to uh, be lost. Yeah. Well, or something like that. just like with this, it's, it's getting lost in that forest and getting familiar with the forest and just like being, I'm in this forest now. Mm -hmm. And it's not like I have an accurate GPS map, but it's like, I can walk around this forest. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm okay. Um, have you seen any of the lectures for for being in time? No. Okay. I think it's it's just one of those things I was like, when I'm ready, I'll, yeah. I'll do it. But yeah. I'm not gonna I don't feel like coming into this lukewarm. For sure. Uh I don't think this is something to be lukewarm about. So why even bother nope. when there's so many you have to choose your choose your, your choose your, your text. Choose, yeah, yeah. So um, it, it's just not one that uh, that I'm ready for, yeah. that, or one that's calling me in my life yet. Yeah. yeah. There's other ones first. No. I'm glad that there's a group of us that are committed to this book. Mm-hmm. Um, because yeah, I I actually uh, well. I, I went to visit in um, uh, Portland, Oregon, uh, like a few weeks ago, and I made it kind of like the point of my my uh, my trip there to try to find this book, mm -hmm. and none of the bookstores had it. I had to, Did I you go to, to like, Powell's? That's where I got this little at Powell's. Yeah. Yeah. And oh no, no, this this one's called Revolutions Bookshop. Okay. But I, I also went to Powell's. And they didn't have that at Powell's? No. Nope. If anything, they, maybe they... <laughs> Get your game up, Powell's. Maybe they had um, a shorter... What do you call it? They had a shorter philosophy section than some of these other... They, yeah. That I went to. They did have... I'm going to turn this off. All right, so sorry. Thank you for reading with me. Thank you for sharing it with the group. Thank you, the group. Anyone who watched it, we'll keep them coming. Peace.